Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, coming to you six days a week as we interview whitetail experts and hear their traditions and personal stories of the hunt. Learn more about the latest gear, discover proven tips, and the latest strategies so you can make your next hunt a success. Now, here's your host, Bruce Hutchin. Welcome to Whitetail Rendezvous Podcast, episode number 258. Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous. This is your host, Bruce Hutchin, and I'm excited to have part two of Dr. Ken Norberg in hunting mature bucks in the northern wilds of Minnesota. Thinking back about yesterday's show and the last show that he talked about, he brought about a lot, a lot of facts that if you put to work, you'll find yourself thinking and and changing up how you hunt whitetails because sometimes what i call run and gun is the way to do it they spot a track they've got a stand already set up where they thought the buck was going to be he didn't show up there so they just take the opportunity adapt and get ahead of the buck and have a better 50 50 chance of seeing that buck and a lot better chance of putting him down so listen to the show take notes here we go with dr ken norberg Hey, listeners, don't forget to text 33444 Food Plot for your free Food Plot ebook. Welcome to part two of Dr. Ken Norton. And we talked about Whitetail Tracks, his new book coming out, uh, 2016 Pocket Guide to Whitetail Tracks, uh, Fall and Winter, in the first segment. Now, this is the second segment where we're going to continue uh, talking about blinds for whitetails. And then we're going to finish up uh, uh, this segment with hunting for mature whitetails. So, Dr. Norberg, uh, welcome to the show again. Okay, thank you. Oh, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> now, yeah. you just said three days. Let's let's just recap for folks. Uh, we ended the last segment with um, when the opener's there, you're sitting your your blind or your tree stand, but the, once day three begins, something else changes over, and you change uh, sights. If you're not seeing a deer in the morning, then at noontime or so, uh, you make a decision and you move to a new spot. Now, how do you decide where that new spot's going to be? Well, uh, the way we do it... Uh is look for them, look for their fresh tracks, uh, you know, freshly made tracks. And we do that midday, usually between 11 and 12. And we end up in camp and have lunch. And then we go out based to places that are uh, where we found those fresh tracks of big bucks. And uh, so uh, we have, uh, it's all, there's, we have a 12, 13 guys in our camp nowadays. I got lots of grandkids in camp nowadays. It probably won't be long. I'll have great grandkids out there as well. But uh, we hunt an area now, uh, a wilderness area that's up to six square miles in size. And throughout all of those square miles, we have certain trails. They're actually deer trails, connecting deer trails that loop widely through each of these areas. And uh, the my sons and I, uh, we cruise those between 11 and noon every day, unless we're bringing in a big buck. But we cruise those every day, and uh, we learn to do that from wolves. Uh, wolves use the same technique of cruising on certain trails to find fresh scents of uh of likely prey, and, and we have a lot of wolves. <laughs> I've been I've been studying wolves now since 1990, and we we have way too many wolves in our country. But they've taught us a lot about deer hunting. But they, and I call their trails that they use, and they you know their hunting areas are up to 100 square miles in size, so they're pretty large. But they follow these specific trails, and we thought, well, gee, wouldn't it be nice if we could do that and smell where the bucks were, you know? And it's, well, we don't need to do that. We can tell where they are by their tracks, and uh, by the sizes of their tracks and how fresh they are. And so uh, every day, usually between 11 and 12, uh, we leave our stand sites and head back to the camp. But on the way, we'll uh, we'll hike as much as we need to. Usually, we don't, you know, we don't have to go through a whole mile to find fresh tracks of a, of a buck, one that's been there this morning, and therefore likely to be there 
<laughs> towards sundown today and probably tomorrow morning as well, as long as we don't alarm that buck. So that's where we go. And we can do this because we don't, you know, we use tree stands. I even used one last year, and we used tree stands during those first three days of the season. But after that, and never more than one, we use at least uh, one stand, uh, one tree stand for only one day, and then we'll go to the second tree stand, the third tree stand, and those locations were determined by scouting. But after that, that scouting information isn't worth much because these bucks, these older bucks especially, and a lot of older does as well, uh, they, once they realize you're in the woods and they smell you or see you or hear you, they know, hey, he's here. He's back in the woods. We got to watch out. <laughs> and so uh, they, they know, they, at least they act like they know that before you mess around out in the woods there, you young deer, you better find out where that hunter is first so you don't get too close to them. And that's kind of their way of living during that period. You know, if if the average hunter could magically make all the trees and all the brush and all the deer tall grasses and stuff disappear for a little bit, it'd be just flabbergasted by how many deer you'd see out there in that square mile. And, uh, you know, what it is, there's 30 of them in that square mile. Up where we hunt, it's a lot less because the wolves eat so many of our thorns every summer. But anyway, uh, you'd be flabbergasted because, you know, before that, you'd be here, you'd be walking around that woods in a square mile or something for days and not seeing a damn deer. How could all those deer be disappearing like that? Well, uh, if if you're an aggressive hunter who hunts on foot or makes drives, well, you can drive them out of there quickly, you know, at the end of the day or end of three days, there probably won't be many deer in your hunting area. But if you're a stand hunter, and if, and if you don't play around doing other things that you shouldn't be doing, but if you're a stand hunter, those deer are going to stay there. And, but you're still not seeing them because they find you so quickly, those older ones. Now, that's not true of fawns that are without their mothers or, or yearlings, yearling bucks make mistakes all the time and that's why the yearling buck is probably the most uh the vulnerable deer in america and it's probably the average white tail on her favorite target and, oh boy i got a buck and he's big he looks big anyway not near as big as uh as a three and a half to six and a half year old buck but he's he's decent and they feel good about getting them but they make mistakes and uh but not not those great big guys. They don't often make mistakes. And uh, so if you're going to be serious about hunting them, the only way to stay close to them is, uh, first of all, stand hunt, and your deer will stay in your hunting area throughout the hunting season if you're a dedicated stand hunter, and everybody else you hunt with there is a stand hunter. They'll stay there. But if you're not seeing it, because seeing them is because they get, they find you so quickly by a sense, sight, and smell and recognize you and even, and, and how you hunted the last couple of years. See, you go on that trail and you go over to that tree stand over there and see once they don't even have to look very hard at first because they, they recognize you and recognize what you've been doing and they have excellent memories. And my wife and I, Proved that so many times with deer all over the country, including down Texas. My God, those deer remember us every year after we'd been gone for a whole year. And uh, they had special ways of recognizing us, including my wife's voice, and she would show up so quickly. Wild deer, wild places. And uh, so, anyway, uh, so uh, that's why we move every half day. <laughs> that's a long answer to the question. So let's now talk, swing it to um, the, the the blinds, and you're talking about uh, tree stands, and you rotate those. Now it seems to me mostly the majority of hunting is down uh, is done from ground blinds. Is that true? Well, yeah, natural blinds in the past, but I, I'm going to be doing most of this season, if not all of it, in a, in one of these new ground blinds that I bought from Cabela's. And uh, I'm really anxious uh, to see how that works out. I think it's going to be excellent. And uh, I was going to say, now, what I've heard... Um, 
you know, uh, guys that are using ground blinds, they they place them well before season, more or less like their tree stands, and then they brush them up, and you know, they they mold them into the, the local area. If they're in a swampy area, then it's marsh grass close to corn. It's corn. Uh, in in the you know the thickets, they'll use the uh, the willow or or poplar or whatever. Uh, in the hardwoods, it gets really difficult because. Um, you know, uh, in the oak, um, then you, if they're a mature forest, then you know it, it's hard to put you know a new rock in place. I'll just call it that, a new object, because as I've heard, uh, whitetails know everything about their their house, uh, the bedroom, and their kitchen, and their family room, and their porch. And something new comes in there, they react to it. Your thoughts on that? Well, I agree 100. percent The one thing I don't agree with, though, is sitting in one place <laughs> long. Not if you want to take big bucks. I um, it, 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 you know, a ground blind isn't going to change anything. It's in that regard. They're still going to find you. There's they they're, they're going to smell you. They're going to hear you. Uh, it, you know, you just can't magically get to that spot without the uh, deer along the way uh, recognizing you, uh, moving on into cover and staying out of your way and and, and and you pass them up and that kind of thing, you're heading over that way. I think one of the dangers of the way people are using the darn things is that they do put them in one spot. And it's like uh, cover sense, like fox urine uh, many years ago. Gee, that works so good. And some deer even followed trails of fox and they're really curious about them. And I, I've taken bucks close to tree stands, uh, taken deer that did that following the fox urine. And it uh, did seem to do a good job of uh, making it difficult for whitetails to recognize you. But it was used so much that within a few years, anytime they smelled fox urine, they thought, Deer hunter, <laughs> stay away from that guy, you know. Uh, and it's going to happen with these darn uh, with the ground blinds as well. If people don't use them properly, there, you know, within ten years, whitetails everywhere will will recognize, will quickly find them and and uh, and start avoiding them. I think right now they're pretty vulnerable to this, but. There's two things, you know, you see all these videos on TV and these guys using these blinds and they're sitting out in the open and they use them like that. They get turkeys all the time from these things sitting right out in the middle of a field. And you just can't do that with older bucks or, or, or even older whitetails, uh, does, but because they're too smart for that. And uh, the, these blinds have a definite shape to them. And they got, you know, they're square. And mine is teepee shaped. Uh, it's a one man blind. They call it the outhouse blind. But uh, they, they, they are different in shape than anything in the woods. I mean, it looks like a little building here. And uh, it, it, in order for it to work like I want it to, I, I recognize right from the outset that that blind has got to be hidden. You know, I say you got to have it in cover where it kind of blends in with everything. I think when it's in cover like that, it, then I aren't going to notice it so well and so much. And if you're not making noise in there, and or if you're, but you, and there again too, you got to be downwind or crosswind from where you expect to see the deer if you're going to be successful. But that doesn't mean all the deer in the woods are just going to be upwind of you. A lot of them will end up downwind of you as well, and they're going to identify you as a stand hunter because the source of your scent isn't moving. It's coming from one spot. It doesn't they can walk over this way and they don't smell it in that way. They don't smell it. Come back and there it is. They know you're a stand hunter. And so they're going to start avoiding that spot. So I think to really get the best out of one of these, uh, you, it's got to be hidden by natural cover, you know, kind of masked a little bit. It can't be out in the open. And you got to move it often. And they're so light and easy to set up and take down, you know, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to do that. And and the way I'm going to do it, like I just explained earlier, uh, every time I move, I'm going to be setting up uh, with an easy shooting range of very fresh tracks of a mature buck. And uh, that's the way I'm planning to do it. But, and, and the nice thing about it is that, you know, instead of depending on blinds that are built before or spots I've used before, 
which can wear out, you know. Uh, they uh, pretty soon every adult deer in the area knows about that spot. Uh, I can I can use it immediately anywhere I find fresh tracks. I might be heading out in the morning and I was going to go somewhere, and holy cow, here's a buck. He's been walking through here. Look at that. He's dragging this track. I, I'm going to go to this feeding area. It's just over to the right over this way, a little ways. That's where I'm going to go now. doesn't matter. I'm not stuck with a tree stand or with a blind that's sitting in one place. I, my my blind is on my back. It's uh, attached to my hunting stool. And I'm going to go over there and I'm going to come in from downwind. And I can set that up with hardly making a noise. You know, they have to be right on top of me to hear me doing that. And get in there, I uh, and uh, sit down on my stool and open two of the windows. Now, I don't want to open all of them because I don't want the silhouette of my head seen moving in there. I just want it to be all nice and black behind me, and put on my head net. Uh, even though I'm in there, I, I still feel I need a head net because the human skin is so bright and easy to spot by white tails. And so you need the head net, and you should have gloves on your hands as well to prevent that from happening. But Another thing that, you know, you can do it from then, uh, that gives you the best concealment possible, I think, in the woods. It's better than natural cover. You're completely 100% safe from being seen moving in there. You can stand up and stretch, stretch your legs, lean back, look around uh, uh, without being seen. Uh, you can't do that in a tree stand. You can't do it on the ground uh, in natural cover. You've got to be very still there. And the thing is, lightweight, easy to carry around the woods, and you can have a virtually silent setup with it. And it'll provide some protection from cold breezes and precipitation. They say light precipitation. I don't know if that means if it's heavy, it isn't so good, but we'll see. Uh, and it, like I say, you can occasionally stand and stretch. And boy, you know, if you're a stander, you know, you, you get to the point where, God, you got to do something. You got to straighten out your legs and lean back and stretch the muscles in your back and that kind of thing. Boy, they can't see you doing that when you're in one of these things. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful thing for deer hunting if it's used properly. And if everybody uses it wrong, it won't be long. Dark on white tails or have them figured out. And they won't. They won't be near as good as they were at one time. Just like tree stands, they they were so amazingly effective back in the seventies and eighties, but they're just not near as effective now as they were back then. But anyway, uh, so those thing- are. Yeah, let me throw this in. One thing I know on the farm, we've been hunting uh, on and off for um, 50 years, and then uh, of late, I, I go back there every fall. Um, we have stands that we've killed bucks, sometimes mature bucks, and, and mostly two and a half, three and a half year old bucks. Um, We've shot from these stands year on, year out, and, and of course shot does because they're right in funnels and pinch points, and you know they're strategically set. And year after year, they they produce. And I, I think of you know big block blinds and tower blinds and all these blinds that you know uh, have been standing in the same place, the same you know um, uh, spot for for years and years i know one place um, i hunted um, in upper wisconsin they used to have a deck of cards you know it, it was a deck of cards place and they'd have um, they take all all the uh, face cards and then if you got the ace of, ace of diamonds you know right where you're going to go and the king of hearts and the jack and all the other and that's how they they did oh. the stand yeah but that that's years i mean you know that we're talking 30 40 50 years of hunting and they haven't changed anything but yet every year um yeah they're competing with the wolves but um you know they take they take deer now What's happening that I've heard, you know, talking to people from North America, more and more guys, gals, and kids um, will, will, a kid can shoot anything as far as I'm concerned. If it's legal, have them pull the trigger. And same thing with young, um, with women who haven't hunted. Anything legal, pull the trigger. But for the guys and gals and even kids uh, that have been hunting for a few years, everybody's kind of saying, hey, I'm going to let the little ones, uh, uh, go so they can grow and we're starting to see more deer off our farm 
uh, a couple of years back, we took a 160, a 135, and a and uh, a Pope and Young uh, qualifier or 125 plus other deer. Uh, but you know, we're seeing larger deer just because we're letting them go and grow. But they're still coming by the same stands we've had there for 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah, we have to redo them, but it, the same box blinds and the Taj Mahal, blah, 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 blah. And yet every year we see deer from those blinds. So help me understand, you know, how that all works. Well, uh, I can remember all oh, back in the 80s, 70s and 80s, uh, we built, uh, that was before you know, he could buy any portables in uh, in a in a in a store. Uh, back in the seventies, uh, tree stands were unknown, and uh, I built uh, for, for study purposes to start with. I built uh, twenty two of them out in the woods, and uh, when, those served my kids really well. They they all took really nice bucks. Some of them the biggest bucks Nordbergs have ever taken uh, during those years from stands that we used year after year, like you're talking about. But by 1989, we were starting to, we were seeing bucks in the distance reacting, you know, they're downwind of us reacting like, hey, I know you're there. I'm, I'm getting out of here, you know, and that was starting to happen quite often. And at that time, I, when I wrote my third edition of Whitetail Hunter's Almanac, I introduced a, a new way of using tree stands, uh, using at least three a season, so you didn't weren't being caught in one the same one each time. And then at that time, we were using portables, and we could put those portables in new places so rather than rely on the same stands uh, and going to them on the same trails year after year. Now. We, where we hunt now, uh, we take, and I, I would say about 75% of the bucks we take are those two and a half to three and a half year old bucks. Uh, bucks that had the misfortune of living in that square mile where, where some great big buster was the, the king of the area. Uh, what we're always looking for is taking one of those big ones and, uh, the four and a half to six and a half year olds, and they're tough. They're tough. That's the kind of bucks we're looking for. But every once in a while, here comes a two and a half year old or three and a half year old, and one or more of us can't stand it. We got to shoot that thing, and that's that. So we, every year, we usually go home with four or five bucks, but only one. And I've never known it ever that was a dominant breeding buck. And that's the kind we all start the season hoping to take. So when I'm talking about, you know, hunting older bucks, that's the kind of bucks I'm thinking about. These are the great big ones and uh, the big dominant bucks. And they are not so easy. But, yeah, you know, went there a couple of years ago, my, my son Ken, he took a big dominant buck opening morning. And then he ended up getting uh, two of them, uh, one a two-and-a-half-year-old and one a three-and-a-half-year-old at tree stands in other areas. But by that time, you know, the, none of those trees, one tree stand had been in the same spot now and then, uh, maybe once in three years, uh, it, during the past years, the past 25 years. And uh, But most of our tree stands each year are somewhere else. And uh, portable, and we start each season looking for a place that we think will be dynamite for taking a dominant breeding buck, and sometimes it works out. I've taken uh, one of the biggest I ever taken was an opening morning buck, and and uh, my my son Ken got his uh, biggest one on an opening morning uh, tree stand, and my son Dave got his biggest one all in the mid season, uh, second weekend. Uh, from a ground blind, uh, natural blind. So, but in a lot over the long run, we take more from our ground blinds during the season rather than on opening day. And opening day, we turned on a lot of bucks. You know, eight pointers going by that. You know, we're always thinking ten pointer or better uh, in the beginning at least. And uh, uh, so, and we don't take yearlings or rarely do and uh unless you know there just aren't many deer that year because of the wolves or bad winters but uh and we've had those but uh 
the the big ones. You know, these are the bucks everybody looks at it on calendars and and uh, covers of outdoor magazines and things like that. And, and hardly any, and, you know, they just aren't taken very often. But that's what we like. Uh, it would be easy for us if we decide, well, if they are two and a half years older, but years of age or older, that's good enough. Uh, we can go home every year with two and a half year olds. And, uh, you know, we never take more than four or five, depending on our current population, because uh, if we did that, pretty soon we'd be looking for another area to hunt. And uh, yeah, you can't be shooting that many bucks. There's usually only, at best, five mature bucks, bucks that are two and a half years of age or older in a square mile in the area where we hunt. A lot of times there's only three. So if you're too hot on your bucks, that, that's not good. <laughs> so they have Let's talk about quarter. Sure. Yeah. Let's talk about the natural ground blinds. We, we, we've talked about the new pop-ups and, and how are you going to uh, use that? And, and they've been around for a long time and people have had success. And I know the, the, the pop-up blinds that we've had, uh, we had to brush them up. We had to kind of make them fold into the environment and then, uh, and okay. then they were successful. They they can't be sitting out in in, in the middle of a alfalfa field and no. they don't see it. I mean, yeah. they'll they'll just see it. So talk to me about building. Uh, we're going to finish up the show here and talk to me about uh, selecting where and the types of materials you use to build a ground blind. How high is it? Um, you know everything about it. Okay. Um. You know, for years we we were we were building them out of fallen branches and trees, and uh, we we build them high and we we made them U shaped, and uh, we had to put them uh, incorporate some natural feature there, like a big boulder or a great big fallen tree or something, so that what we ended up with didn't look out of place. You know, it looked like you know it hadn't changed much there. But we use farm branches. We never use cut branches. We didn't want any white, fresh cuts on the on the on the material we use. But we made them U shaped, and we made them high enough so that only <laughs> you were only visible from the nose up while you were sitting on your stool. You know, and we'd have a stool along when we made them, and we'd sit down and oh, it's got to be a little higher here, a little higher on this side and that side. And so we built a lot of those. But we get, we've been getting tired of them, and uh, we found out through some because of some recent clear cuts that were done in our hunting area uh, that we were building them too close to the edge of a clear cut, and we found those that were built further back in, and they were further back in because they made use of this great big pine that had fallen down or something like that. Those blinds did really well. In fact, one of them right now, uh, we've taken good bucks from that one three years in a row. Uh, we had some years ago that were like that. My son Ken seemed to have the best of them. He got five from one blind one year and, I, and five more from a different blind a mile away the, uh, the next five years. And the rest hey, of us Ken, are, Dr. Yeah. Norberg. Okay, some of our listeners aren't familiar with the hunting regulations in Minnesota, so they're saying, how does he get five deer? How does he get three deer? Explain that so everybody well, doesn't... No, well, for five crazy. seasons in a row, one deer each year, you know, one nice buck each year, but you got ten nice okay. bucks in ten years from two two spots. Now, that's rare. You know, we don't... <laughs> and we don't count on that, but once in a while, we'll find one that might be good for three years, and we don't... But sometimes uh, we're, we're, there's been times when we've taken one uh, opening weekend and then we leave it alone for one to two weeks and go back and get another one. That's happened a few times. But uh, in time, they wear out. And uh, and the kind of bucks that we w would like to be seeing, uh, they just don't. We just don't see them there anymore. So we know to move. But anyway. Uh, the, the natural, the, what we stopped making the, the, those blinds, which were a fair amount of work. You know, it, it, we got a whole lot of hunters in camp, and and uh, we can't just live in one for the whole season. So we we were making a lot of them. And uh, in fact, I used to have a hunting school every year, and I'd have these guys that would come to my school in May, uh, help build some of those. <laughs> so 
but now we use mostly natural blinds, you know, things that natural cover that's out there. One of them is, so well, there was a storm and a couple of trees went down and my son, uh, one of my grandsons got his first buck there last year from one of those spots. And what I, I, I've learned that I don't have to have a lot. Uh, as long as you're sitting very still wearing a head net and gloves. Uh, two of the biggest bucks I've taken recently, I, I was sitting behind a little pine tree, no more than six feet tall, you know, white pine. But with these grass around me and some brush around me, and I, I, my head wasn't exposed. I was peeking between branches of that, that pine tree in front of me. And those, well, three bucks I've taken like that recently. And or four, and I think of another one. Uh, they never saw me. And I poked my gun barrel through that space between those branches and uh, used that little tree for a nice rest and took a very careful aim, and I shot them all in the neck. And down they all went. So, How close were they? How close were those bucks? Uh, the furthest one was about 100 yards, and uh, two of them were only 25 yards away. And uh, it's kind of amazing. You know, as long as you're still and you don't have an exposed skin, uh, you got something that that it, that does a pretty good job of masking your body. That's about all you need. And so we've learned now that, gee, you know, sometimes one of the bigger bucks that took in some years, uh, uh, I, I ran into a spot where he had been fighting with another buck. And this was fresh tracks. I said, holy cow. Uh, that that was while well, breeding was in place, and that means there's two bucks in this area. And so I backed off. That was in the dark, and and sat in front of a great big, uh, well, poplar tree. There, there, uh, quaking aspens. That was wide enough to uh, hide my silhouette. And there was a lot of old chin high brush in front of me. A little little sapling trees actually they were about what we call mountain maples but uh, it was really dense there in front of me but my head was above that and I sat down and, and right near there was a, a freshly pod browse grave when you find one of those while breeding is in progress it means the buck that did it is trying to warn another buck to stay away from this doe I'm with you know and that's important to him at that point if you find one then you don't find them all over you don't find them every year but when you do boy that's a spot to be but anyway uh he came along and he was rubbing his scalp on overhanging branches when I spotted him and uh was pretty easy shot. He was only 25 yards away, and I raised my rifle, shot him in the. He, he was turned his head, turning. I shot him in the throat patch, and down he went. <laughs> and uh, so, it's amazing how little you can get along with. I, I wear camel blaze orange, and uh, I wouldn't wear solid blaze orange because it looks glowing white to white camels, but camel takes a lot of that away from it. But anyway. Uh, yeah. Dr. Ken, I hate to uh, stop you here, and um, we're going to come back and visit you again, but we're at the time of the show. Tell people how to get a hold of you, um, how to buy your books, get to your blog, get to your website. So share that information, and if you want to give props to your hunting uh, crew up there in northern Minnesota, your kids and friends and uncles, and please do that, and then we'll wrap the show. Okay, well... You can find out everything about me and where to go to or how to order my books, uh, whether from me directly. I've had I have lots of those, and or from uh, Apple <laughs> iBooks or or Amazon. Find all the information in my website, and my website is a little bit of a long one, so I'll say this slowly. Uh, my website is www dot dr for doctor dr Nordberg, no Kim, just D.R. Nordberg, and Nordberg is N-O-R-D-B-E-R-G at uh, yeah, and, uh, let me get back now, D.R. Nordberg on deerhunting.com Now, you don't even have to do that, just put, put my name on your Internet Explorer, and you'll come to a page with all kinds of stuff, all kinds of alternative about me and look for my website there and click on that and you go to that and then you'll get directions for going to my blogs which are really interesting about a lot of things <laughs> and uh, my uh, Twitter 
uh, call, and uh, then all the information you need to go to Apple or Amazon and all those things. So, uh, well, Dr. Yeah. Ken, I can't tell you how much, and and I look forward to visiting you um, after after season and after another season. What do you call your camp up there in northern Minnesota? Well, well, we just call it Deer Camp. It's uh, it's three miles from the Canadian border, and uh, it's wild, roadless country that we hunt, and rugged, and uh, hilly, and there's nice streams going through there, and it's a beautiful area, and we love it. And it, it just we don't have a lot right now. Our deer population is down to six per square mile because of the wolves and severe winters. And I think if there was only one deer in a square mile, I, I, actually hunting success is uh, in that area for the last three years has been one deer per ten square miles. But that's not where I start for you to keep doing well. <laughs> You're a little better than that. So, Dr. Ken Neuberg, thank you so much for being a guest of Whitetail Rendezvous. And hope our listeners throughout North America really enjoyed the time we spent with you over the last couple of days. So, Dr. Ken, thank you so much, sir. Well, thank you. And, and uh, I, I'm always, you know, I'm a teacher. I love to teach. I love to share what I've learned. And so there you are. You got some good advice today. <laughs> Thank you, and goodbye now. Make sure you turn into the next show. We're going to go north of the border with Henny Mora. Now, Hanny is uh, an entrepreneur. Actually, he's a software entrepreneur, and he makes plugins for WordPress. What does this all mean to you, my listeners across North America who love the hunt? Well, a lot of you are building content. A lot of you are taking videos. A lot of you are writing articles and taking photos and posting on social media. Hanny has tools that can help you do a better job, be more efficient, and more effective with getting your word out and building your relationships with your clients, with your friends, with your neighbors, and uh, with your audience. So it's going to be an interesting show. Hanny definitely has game, and you're going to want to listen to it. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.